Mm -hmm. oh, hi, it's, my name is Paul and I live here in Toronto. I have a question. Uh, I know from a Canadian point of view, the vast majority of the land conflict was in essentially Upper Canada, Ontario. There was, there was some fighting in, in Quebec, but what about Atlantic Canada, especially let's say New Brunswick and Nova Scotia? Was there any type of conflict there? Especially land conflict. Um, there's, there's virtually nothing in the way of land conflict. Occasionally an American privateer, a private warship, a for-profit warship, would land on the coast of Nova Scotia and plunder some fishermen. Uh, but that's it. Now, why is there not much land combat? It's because the Royal Navy controls the Bay of Fundy. And it's very hard uh, to attack the Maritimes unless you have naval supremacy, which the United States did not have. Also, the New England states were the region in which the Federalists were strongest, and they were adamantly opposed to the war. And uh, they refused to allow their state militias to participate in any military activity. So American war planners pretty early took the, the maritime provinces off the agenda. Now the Maritimes are very important for a couple of reasons in the war. They are bases for the Royal Navy, especially Halifax, and for Canadian privateers that were very active attacking American merchant ships. And also there's this very robust smuggling trade that enriches a lot of people in Nova Scotia and a few in New Brunswick because Americans then as now like their imported consumer goods. Only then they didn't get them from China. <laughs> they got them from Britain. And so there is this very active smuggling trade with the Federalist merchants of New England that is going through the Maritimes. Thank you for that Thank question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next person, please. Uh, it was interesting in your book to uh, discover how politicized the U.S. Army was at the beginning of the war. And then by the, the final Niagara campaign, you had people like Jacob Brown and Winfield Scott rising. How was the U.S. Army able to depoliticize itself? Uh, well, basically, the um, political appointees turn out to be such hacks that they, they lose their battles and they get captured. And that means they have to, on the American side, find, promote people from the middle ranks on up. Now, Jacob Brown was a political appointee too, but occasionally you just, through dumb luck, you get somebody who's a political appointee who can grow into the job. And that was Jacob Brown. Jacob Brown was smart enough to know what he didn't know. So he relied very heavily on Winfield Scott, who was a professional soldier. He'd been in the American Army uh, before the war. He'd been in the Army for at least five years when the war began. Very well-read man, a very ambitious, hyper-ambitious. And basically, Brown turned over the management of his army and the drilling of his army to Scott. And Scott was a formidable man. He was six foot four, probably about 225 pounds of muscle. And he could swear more eloquently than anybody in the American Army. <laughs> so you didn't want to cross Winfield Scott. And he terrified the American troops into actually developing some discipline. So by the end of the war, through that process of attrition, that helps to bring to the forefront some people with some actual military ability, and it helps to improve the quality of the American soldier by the end of the war. When the Americans declared war, uh, John, J I think you were referring to this earlier, but you didn't say the name. It was John Jacob Astor, who was the, the fur magnate, who had a tremendous stake in seeing that uh, all of his furs and his lines of supply were maintained. And so he sent an emissary over the border after he found out about the declaration of war so that this emissary then told the British and that Isaac Brock knew about the declaration before the Americans did in Mackinac out in, the, uh, in, in northern Lake Michigan. And I wanted to know how could that not possibly be conceived as treason? 
<laughs> um, okay, l let me, uh, th that's an excellent question. There are other kind of two parts to it. First is to just flesh in the details of that story, which is that John Jacob Astor, a uh, very wealthy man, uh, is a, in effect a, a one-man multinational corporation. Uh, he had business interests in Canada in the fur trade. And he didn't want his furs on the Canadian side of the border to be confiscated by the British. So he, he wanted news of the war to get to his trading partners. Well, it turns out that in the United States of 1812, there was already insider trading. <laughs> John Jacob Masters is the best of friends with the American Secretary of the Treasury, who tells Astor that the war has been declared. And Astor hires a faster rider than the US government engages. And rides all the way up to Niagara, gets across the river, tells his contact in what's now Niagara on the lake, who then tells Isaac Brock. Isaac Brock then arrests the American officers who were over visiting Niagara on the lake <laughs> on a social call with no clue that war had been declared. Brock then sends word to British officer up on Lake Huron and says, you know, I think it would be a good idea to go over and grab Mackinac before the Americans know what hits them. And that's exactly what happened. So the American commander is surrounded suddenly by this mixed force of French Canadians, small number of British and a very large number of Indian warriors who paint themselves to the max and do the performance for the benefit of the American soldiers, who then say, we surrender. And it turns out that a lot of those soldiers were themselves French Canadians who had enlisted on the American side. So they were told, you know, you are now traitors against the king because Quebec's part of the empire. So we could hang you or you could enlist in British forces. They decided to enlist in British forces. <laughs> now, a lot of them had enlisted in British forces in the past. There was a lot of going back and forth to get bounties from different sides. Uh, so then the question becomes, why isn't John Jacob Astor and his uh, emissary, he's kind of the reverse of Paul Revere, because he rides <laughs> to the British to say the Americans are coming. <laughs> Uh, why, you know, they arrest this guy, Vosberg, um, but they can't make the charge stick. Why can't they? Uh, because the American law of treason at that point set such a high threshold that the only way you would qualify as a traitor is if you went over to the British side, picked up a gun, and shot an American. You have to be found in arms fighting against the United States. So simply conveying this business information to the other side, while it is disastrous for the American war effort, does not qualify as treason under the Constitution of the United States as it was in 1812. Ladies and gentlemen, I gotta be a bit of a bad guy here. Alan's voice has really had a workout, so let's take two more questions and then we're gonna give him a break. First one, please. Uh, Charles Ritchie, I, I admit I haven't read your book, but and what you said in the talk earlier was something of a surprise to me, that you said that there were, at, the, at 1812, there were either 100 or 1,000 ships in the Royal Navy and only 10 in the U.S. of A. I said 21 for the U.S. Sorry. Um, what I'm surprised is that, presuming there was that large amount of ships in the Royal Navy in the War of Independence in 1776, why then did the UK armies lose in that conflict? And was it basically ineptness vis-a-vis uh, -vis losing the Battle of New Orleans? Because I presume there were a number of ships available then that could be used to fight that battle. Okay, so the question about the revolution is why did the British lose that earlier war? Uh, at that time, partly as the Royal Navy wasn't as big as it would become in 1812, the British Navy goes through this massive expansion during the Napoleonic Wars. Second reason is the French and the Spanish entered the war as allies of the United States. This is during the Revolution. 
And at that time, the French Navy had undergone some very significant reforms. And the French Navy did a pretty good job of fighting the British in that war. And indeed, they won what is arguably the most important naval battle of the revolution, which was they occupied the mouth of Chesapeake Bay. And when a British fleet tried to break through to relieve the British army of Lord Cornwallis at Yorktown in Virginia, the French repelled the British attack. And that meant that Lord Cornwallis in 1781 had to surrender. And it is that defeat that is politically crushing to Lord North's administration in England. And so a peace administration comes in, and it will lead to peace negotiations in 1782. So it's really the combination, then, of French and Spanish naval power that helps the United States to win the war sufficiently on land in the Revolution. Thank you. Last question, please. Alan Hooks, uh, a history teacher. I was wondering how historians like yourself and, and many others who write on the War of 1812 can draw on uh, such confident information about Tecumseh and often quote some of his speeches. And I'm wondering right. what the sources are for that. Well, there are, and there are a number of sources. Um, one is that British officers in particular but also American officers, when they would um, be engaged in any negotiations with Tecumseh, were fascinated by him. And they would record in their journals translations of what he had said. In, and there is also a phenomena called council minutes. Whenever the American, British, or French officials would have a formal discussion with First Nations peoples. There would be secretaries and translators there, and an exchange of very formal speeches, which would be written down in the language of the colonial power. So this does come through a filter. And it's been an interpretive question among historians as to how much of what's recorded is authentically the words of First Nations people. Now, it, one wouldn't like to throw those sources entirely out because we would like to know what the words were of First Nations people, and these are our best chances to get them in written documents. Now, of course, there are also oral traditions among Native peoples, and that's another source for what we understand about Tecumseh. But to go back to the council records for a minute, often they say things that are very insulting to the colonial people recording this, basically laying out their misdeeds. One of the most famous speeches that Tecumseh is supposed to have said, it was delivered at Amherstburg when Henry Proctor was preparing to retreat and Proctor is trying to persuade the First Nations people, and especially Tecumseh, that they have no choice but to retreat. And Tecumseh, in that recorded speech, refers to Proctor as being like a fat animal with his tail between his legs. So I think, and a lot of historians think, that if we are careful with those council minutes, that we can find the sentiments of First Nations peoples. Ladies and gentlemen, just before I pass this over to Tina to wrap things up, I know you want to join me in thanking Alan Taylor. I've read the book. It was fantastic. Just a great book. Well done. That was superb. Thank you very much.